So welcome back after the break. Um, <clears throat> so I hope, I hope you found um, the earlier lecture interesting. Did it, uh, was it useful? Good, good. So what I want to do now then is, I'm, that was, by the way, that was the soft lecture. Sorry, that's the bad news. <laughs> Things get a little bit more um, complicated now. Um, so what I want to do is, I mentioned to you this morning that we started to make a company, uh, a spin-out company, which is really um, targeted at trying to uh, remove different kinds of metallic ions from wastewater. Um, and we're going to do that using a process known as polymer surfactant aggregates. So, um, okay, you're all water people. Does, does, do you all know what polymers and surfactants are? Does anyone have no idea at all what a surfactant is? I'd be surprised. Anyone not know? Okay. Well, surfactants really are interesting molecules that have both hydrophilic um, and hydrophobic properties, uh, and they're very often used for cleaning. Cleaning. So most cleaning products, detergents, soap, even toothpaste and cosmetics contain um, certain amounts of surfactants. Um, and um, what we've done in this process is to use them in combination with soluble polymers to create systems or flocculation systems that allow, allow us to both to remove or absorb the iron from the system and then to, to recover it. Um, so this was work that was done by myself and my um, PhD or DPhil student, Li Cheng Shen, who's now moved on from Oxford. Um, you'll see this is not the first time I presented this lecture, obviously, but um, I'm going to share that with you today. So let's carry on. So first of all, I'm going to introduce to you what polymer surfactant aggregates are, and I'm going to explain to you, or try to explain to you, how this process works. It's uh, an adsorption, flocculation type process, which is the typical kind of thing that's used for wastewater treatment or even for um, potable water treatment. And I'll show you some results in which we've tried to remove cations, so metallic ions, uh, things like iron, sorry, things like zinc. Um, and then we can remove them, but we can also recover them and recycle them. So what we've done is develop a process where not only the, the waste material can be recovered and recycled, but the agent of removal, which is the polymer and surfactant, can itself be recycled. And this is very nice because it gives us what we call as a zero discharge process. So remember, we were talking earlier about sustainability. If you want to make something that's environmentally sustainable, you don't want to take anything from the environment and you don't want to put anything back into it. So we call that zero discharge, zero resources. And then I'll talk about anion removal. So that's really a mirror image process where everything is reversed in charge and we can remove things like ferrocyanide um, compounds. And then I'll introduce conclusions. So. When we talk about wastewater, is it really waste? Is there such a thing as waste? Well, there is in a certain kind of Victorian way of thinking. that We do things, we create waste, and we throw them away. But nothing is really worth wasting because it can be recovered and recycled. And, and that's true not just of the water, but what's in the water. And what's, what is in the water? Well, there's all kind, in a wastewater stream, there may be organic compounds. There may be inorganic compounds. Um, all of these have a particular value. For instance, organic materials in, in, um, in um, sewage effluent contains materials that can be um, utilized by bacteria anaerobically or even aerobically to create um, materials that will give us energy so we can create methane uh, and other materials. Um, but it may also contain these heavy metals. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they may be things like copper, or iron or platinum, which are very valuable. So we have to, we have to think about ways that we can recover these and use, and use them. So in other words, waste is not a problem, it's an opportunity. So waste is an opportunity, and that's the take home message. So you can think about 
waste as a resource in the wrong place. It's the right thing in the wrong place. And when we have a wastewater stream, what we want to do is um, to divide that into two things. There's the water and the so-called waste, which is really uh, a resource in the wrong place. And this is what we, we want to recover when we use the process. So I'm going to call my waste a resource, and that's, um, that's, an, that's a brave step. It's a brave step, but that's what, we, what's not what we're going to do. Now, at the outset, I'm going to compare my new process with some competing processes, which I'm sure you're probably familiar with. So we can start off um, in the vertical axis with a number of processes. I've got iron exchange, where we, where we exchange one iron for another one of a slightly higher charge. We have membrane filtration, which I'll be talking about later. We have bioabsorption, so just absorbing it onto some natural material like um, carbon, activated carbon, or, or some plant material, for instance. And then related to that is adsorption on an inorganic material. And then we have chemical uh, precipitation. So here we can look at the cost of the process, the complexity of how difficult it is to use, the stability, so how, how does it respond under different conditions, the rate at which it can be used, and then finally the selectivity. And when we look at these different kind of processes for metal recovery, we find that there's a lot of pros and cons. So if you look at iron exchange, iron exchange is probably the way to recover metal ions from waste uh, waters at the moment. And you can see the problem is it's very expensive because we need resins, and the resins have to be regenerated, and eventually they break down and have to be replaced. So this is, this is a, an issue. And the other thing is the complexity because essentially you're running a two-phase system. You have some kind of packed bed that's filled with the resin. Um, that means that you have to pump things through, you have to keep it stable. It, it's, it's complicated, you know. If you go and work in a mine, I've never done it, but I've been told anyway, the guys who work in the mines are quite robust, tough kind of guys, you know. They, they don't have a lot of time for nice things in life. And they certainly don't want to use things that are very complicated. What they'd rather have is something that you put it into a tank, you stir it, magic happens, and you get the, the answer. So this is really what we're thinking about with our process. It's something that's much less complex and inexpensive to use. Look at the stability. Well, iron exchange happens to be very stable, so that's, that's a good point. Um, the speed is, is only medium because if you pump too quickly through the iron exchange bed, it doesn't absorb. It just goes straight out. You know there's a certain rate of absorption for that to, to work. So you have to work slowly. <coughs> But the good thing is the selectivity is high. What do I mean by, does anyone know what selectivity might mean in this context? So if I have a mixture, what would it mean? Any clue? So if I have a mixture of copper and iron, which do you think is the one I want to get? Make a guess. Copper because copper has about 10 times the value of iron on the market. So if I have a waste stream coming out of a mine, I really want to get the copper. I'm not so worried about the iron. I might want the iron as well. But if I really want to um, valorize that stream, I'm going to go for the copper. And that means I need to be selective because nobody wants a mixture of copper and iron. They just want the, the copper when it's, when it's working well. So selectivity is quite a big issue. And if you look at these other processes, you see that membranes the selectivity is not very good. The, um, even by absorption and adsorption are not that selective. I mean, they both adsorb to some extent, but you never get a very selective adsorption. Um, and chemical precipitation, which is where, for instance, you add alkaline to form a hydroxide, which is insoluble, doesn't work very well at all. So if you look at all of these measures, you can see um, that all the other processes have some kind of issue. So adsorption, you see that it's a medium cost, but the, again, the complexity is quite high because you need a two-phase heterogeneous system. Um, 
And again, the speed of treatment is quite low because you have to flow at a small rate to have time to adsorb. And again, the selectivity is, is medium. So, so I, I, I sound like a salesman, but I'm going to say to you that the polymer surfactant method I'm going to explain to you works very well for all of these things. It has a low cost, it has a low complexity, um, has quite a high stability, it has a high treatment speed and a high um, selectivity. Okay, well enough of the kind of sales talk, what about the science? So really, polymer surfactant aggregates work as a kind of complexation uh, and flocculation process. And the idea is that we form these entities, which I'm showing here, which is known as polymer surfactant aggregates. Now, if you look these up in the literature, you'll, you'll also hear them talked about as, as pearl strings. They're like, um, you know, necklaces, where you have a necklace, a long chain on which the pearls are attached. And what's happening here is that I have this long polymer chain, which has a charge, and I have these little aggregates which are made from the surfactants and they're kind of being attracted to the chain in, at different places to give you this kind of necklace. So let's just think about this for, for a minute. This is a surfactant. You can see here I've drawn it with two groups. There's a, a hydrophilic head which likes to be in the presence of water or hydrophilic things and this is uh, a hydrophobic chain. So what happens when you use these molecules when you're cleaning or washing is that they have a tendency to form these structures known as micelles. And the micelles, they, they can be spherical or they can have different shapes. But the point is that inside of here, you have this very hydrophobic environment and that will actually effectively dissolve the grease. So what happens is the grease from the plates, etc., dissolves into this core and then it carries it away and that's exactly how soap works really it it um, the molecules absorb into the grease it lowers the surface tension the flat the fat flows away and then it solubilizes into those um, molecules so the polymer surfactant aggregate really forms by an oppositely charged polymer chain and a surfactant at low concentration now this is an important point that my cells form at quite high concentrations. So if you're using it for cleaning, they have to reach a thing called a critical micelle concentration. Um, if you have a polymer, then you can form these things, which are sort of like miniature micelles, and they form at much lower concentrations, maybe orders of magnitude lower. So that means that we can make this happen with relatively dilute concentrations of the surfactant on the polymer. And that's good because we don't want to contaminate the water too much with these um, additional um, compounds. <coughs> so the target stream might be a waste stream or a resource stream which contains these contaminant ions that might be heavy metals or it might be copper or platinum or something like that. But they are soluble charged species. Uh, and what we'll have here is the, the cationic polymer which I've shown here. And then we have the anionic surfactant, which is here. And then we have cationic contaminants. So really we have a kind of sandwich, plus, minus, plus. Um, if we want to do this in reverse, because we have anionic species, so an example might be a ferrocyanide, ferrocyanide, which has iron, but it also has a cyanide group, and it has a negative um, charge. If they're cationic, an so anionic contaminants, then we need to have a cationic surfactant and an anionic polymer. So we have a sandwich in reverse, but it, the idea is exactly um, the same. Okay, so just remember that and we'll, we'll move on. So how does it work? Well, I start off with this solution, which is a sample of contaminated water that contains the, the cation. Uh, and what I want to do is to remove this, this cation and concentrate it. So uh, what I do is I mix in my polymer and my surfactant, and the, the iron gets absorbed onto the polymer surfactant system, and it will start to precipitate. And that's because you have this 
um, system of positive and negative and positive charge, the whole thing kind of neutralizes itself. So it's a self-flocculating system. So coagulation happens when charges balance, and they exact, exactly balance, and then the particles can start to stick together. And we know that to improve this, we need a certain amount of mixing. So you think about a normal flocculation process. You add chemicals that have opposite charge. The system starts to coagulate. That is to say, the charge neutralizes, and then it starts to stick together. You then mix it, and bigger particles form, and they're big enough to settle out or to, to filter. So we form these um, precipitates, which we, can, which we can probably filter out. So you can see them in the bottom here. Now, what that means is that if you remember the slide that I had earlier, I had these polymer surfactant systems, and we had the metal ions. Um, so now the metal ion is, is stuck to the polymer surfactant chains. But what I want to do is I want to recover it into a concentrated solution. So what I do is I add some acid. And if I add acid, what will happen is the acid is strong enough to displace the cation. So it's really what's happening is you have very, very strong charges. And that's displacing the positive charge of the metal ion. So the metal ion get, gets pushed away. And of course, if you have an acid, remember that acids have protons, but they have an anion. So sulfuric acid has H2SO4. You have the H2, which is the protons. That's now going on to the polymer surfactants. And you have the sulfate, SO42 minus, which is forming a salt with the metal. So what I'm getting down here is a concentrated salt of, let's say, um, copper, copper sulfate, something like that. So you see the color. That's because, in this case, I think I have um, chromium. But anyway, you have a chromium salt. And that's, that's pretty concentrated because I've, I've treated this solid and I've got a very concentrated salt phase. So what I've done is I've removed the metal ions from the solution, and I've created this concentrated salt. The question you're going to ask me is what happened to the polymer and surfactant? Well, that's still here in the liquid phase, and I don't want to waste it because I want to recycle it. And in fact, what I want to do is to recover that water as a kind of clean water phase. So what I do is I use basification, and basification in this case, case allows me to recover the polymer and surfactant. So that means I'm adding um, hydroxide, and hydroxide will go um, the other way. It will cause the polymer and surfactant to, to separate, and that can be placed back into the system at the start. So I start with contaminated water. What I do is I produce precipitates here, and I have clean water here. I've treated my solids to give me a concentrated salt solution. What's, rest of, what's left of the solids, I treat with basification to recover my re recovery agent, and then I recycle that back into the process. So what I have is basically a zero discharge process. The only thing that's coming out is clean water, concentrated salt, and everything else is going back in. So that's one of the very big advantages to this process, zero discharge. So let's have a look in detail at what's going on here. This is the <clears throat> polymer chains. You can see them here. And I've shown you the aggregates, which have an opposite charge. And then here are the metallic ions. So th in this case, they have a double charge. That could be copper or iron, or it could be zinc or lead. Uh, or some precious metal, and you see what happens is they all absorb onto one or other of these surfaces. Now, at the moment, the attraction that's going on is electrostatic, but what I can do is I can use special um, groups on these polymer chains. So what I can do is I can use collating agents, and the collating agents allow me to get a specific absorption of those ions. So if I want to choose between 2 plus iron and 2 plus copper, I only need to have the right kind of groups along this chain. The interaction then is no longer necessarily electrostatic. 
it could be more a sort of chemical complexation. But either way, I can make that uh, a very uh, specific um, interaction. So what happens is you have all of these things are coming together. We have the chains, we have the aggregates, we have the metal ions. And what that does is it neutralizes the charge. And when you neutralize the charge in the colloid, what happens is the hydrophobic forces take over. So normally particles that have similar charges repel. But when the charges have been neutralized, they can get closer and closer together. And if they get close enough together, they actually stick. And that's because of um, van der Waals forces. So um, I'm not sure. I hope you've heard of those. Van der Waals forces are intermolecular forces that are very important at short range. And that means everything sticks together. And you also get bridging. So these polymers can bridge with the other polymers through these groups. And let's just see how that works. So you see how that one has stuck there. And then I think we get another one there. The idea is that you're getting a much bigger particle. And bigger particles are good, because not only can you settle them out, but you can filter them. So the binding force is mainly electrostatic, but it can also include um, collating groups. And the contaminants, because, they, because the, charge, the charges all balance here, so they help the flocculation to happen. To, to, to happen. So you have a self-flocculating system. Okay, you have the contaminant that you're trying to remove, which is really a resource, is also a self-flocculant. And that enhances the flocculation via a bridging effect. And that means that the whole thing can be zero discharge because it's going to remove itself, and that works quite well. Okay, so I hope you've, you've sort of got the um, idea. Is, is there any question about that? Is that... Uh, too much to take in. Do you... you can read about this at leisure, don't worry, I'm not going to test you today, but um, I would like you to read the papers and then you can understand it better. So let's look at the results, let's look at how well this works and um, let me tell you about what's going on in this diagram. So in this diagram I'm looking at the effectiveness of removal of zinc, which is a, a divalent ion, and I'm plotting that as a function of here, which is the surfactant concentration. So I've got a fixed amount of polymer, but I'm going to change the surfactant. And I'm going to see how well this works in removing the, the zinc. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually plot the surface tension. Um, I hope you know what um, surface tension is. So surface tension, if you have an interface between air and water, there's a tension in the surface because the water molecules are trying to pull themselves together, but the, the air is trying to get away. So you have this interface between two very different molecules, and there's a certain natural uh, interfacial tension. But if I adsorb molecules onto that surface, that tends to break those forces up, and that reduces the, the, the surface tension. So as an example, if you have uh, a mixture of um, oil and water, you know that if you shake the oil and water, it's going to quickly separate and you have two phases. If you add some soap to that and shake it up, it's going to completely disperse. And that's because the surface, the surfactant, which is very surface active, adsorbs at the interface between the two phases. That reduces the surface tension. And effectively, the two phases become miscible. They become mixable. So that's, that's really what's happening. They, they emulsify. And look what happens here is that as we, as we add... Um, Low, we, we, as we add the surfactant, you see how the surface tension is, is, is decreasing. That's what we expect to happen. But suddenly it, it jumps up. It, suddenly it jumps up. And the reason it jumps up is because initially the surfactant is absorbing at the interface between the air and the water. But above a certain concentration, which is about here, this is where we start to form the surfactant aggregates I showed you. And when those aggregates are forming, the surfactant molecules are being moved away from the surface into the interior of the solution. So you see how suddenly the surface tension jumps up, and it's gone to quite a high value because now the surface is relatively clean. Okay. And this is the kind of, this is the sweet spot. This is the hot spot. It's the, the honey spot. That's where you need to get to because that's where the absorption is best. So look what happens. Here's the zinc removal. It's pretty lousy at low concentration. It's about 30%. When I get to this critical aggregate concentration, it's risen 40, and then suddenly it jumps right up to here. So I'm getting 
100% removal. So that's pretty sure confirmation that the formation of those surfactant aggregates is causing the adsorption of the ions. And you can see that just in this point, it's very high. It's almost 100%. Now, as I keep on increasing the surfactant concentration, you see how the surface tension peaks, and then it starts to drop off again. So eventually, the polymer becomes saturated. And then eventually here, I form my cells. So can you see how the surface tension here is constant? That's because when I form these my cells, any additional surfactant is just forming more my cells. So the surface tension becomes constant. But also you notice how the zinc removal is dropping off. It's, it's flattening out and, and dropping off down here. Because <coughs> now the surfactant is no longer involved in aggregates. It's involved in my cells. So what I want to show you is that this is where we need to be. This is where, this is where the action happens. So 0.5 millimolar surfactant concentration, most of the bulk polymers form polymer surfactant aggregates, which is, which is about here. So that's about 0.5 millimolar. The zinc removal efficiency increases with the increasing amount of polymer, polymer surfactant aggregates. So remember that I've drawn this diagram at a fixed polymer concentration, but I found the optimum point here where I have the optimum ratio. And any value either side of that, it doesn't work. So you have a perfect match between the charge of the polymer, the charge of the surfactant, and the metal ions. Now, if I was showing this to someone in a mining company or someone in industry, the first thing they'd ask me is, well, yeah, that looks great, but you did that in a lab. Does it work on a real wastewater stream? And what we know is that real wastewater contains large amounts of both salt um, and organics. And the question is, does that affect the effectivity of, uh, of the process? So again, what I did is I looked at um, the cons I, I increased the amount of salt, in this case, through sodium sulfate, uh, and I looked at the removal efficiency. So you can see here on the top, I'm plotting the removal efficiency of three ions. I've got chromium, I've got zinc, and I've got um, cadmium. And basically, you can see that as I increase the salt, there's very little effect. Now, if I get to something like seawater, so seawater is usually about one molar sodium chloride. It has that level of salinity. You can see it's dropping off a little bit, but um, one of the issues in the process is that when I add acid and base, I'm going to form salt. And as I form more and more salt, salt will accumulate in the process because of this pH adjustment that I showed you earlier. And that might affect the removal efficiency. But you can see here that it actually has um, very little effect. So that's good news. Salt has little effect on the removal performance. And that means that we can go round and round in many, many cycles. We're going to accumulate this salt, but it's still working pretty well. And we also find that organics have relatively little, little effect. Uh, at least at moderate concentration. So we can do this in real wastewaters with a lot of salt and a lot of organics. Um, we can keep recycling the material, we're adding acid and base, but the accumulated salt's not really having any effect. So that, that's good news. The other thing is how quickly it takes to, to work. So again, what I'm going to do here is to plot the removal efficiency as a, as a function of the mixing time. So let's look at the open data points. You can see here chromium efficiency, uh, zinc efficiency, and cadmium efficiency. And you can see that within about 10 minutes, I, I'm there. So, so after 10 minutes of mixing, I've got a reasonably fast um, flocculation. So that's good, because it means that, that with enough mixing, the flocculation and the settling is going to occur. It's pretty rapid. So I've got a fast process. Um, here I'm plotting total carbon content. So this really represents the rate at which the, the polymer and surfactant is being removed. Because remember that we want to recycle that as well. And you can see that, again, after, say, the first 10 or 20 minutes, it's being removed. 
So the content in this case for uh, cadmium decreases a little bit more slowly, but at least for these two, for the, for the chromium and the zinc, you can see that it's pretty constant and it's pretty low. So it means that again, the polymer surfactant has flocculated, it's fallen out of solution, and it's where we um, need it to be. So, so the message here is that we have a, a very quick and rapid flocculation uh, process. Now, let's look at the recovery. So we have, remember we had the first stage was to remove the ions. We wanted to remove the ions and to concentrate at salts. In the second stage, what we want to do is to recover both the polymer and the surfactant. So here we study the cation recovery as a function of pH. So remember that we wanted to use a low pH because the low pH would displace the metal ions from the, the polymer. And you can see that as the, as the pH decreases, can you see how that recovery is increasing? So what's happening as I drop the pH is the metal ions are being displaced from the polymer and they're being put into the salt form and the acid is going on to the polymer. And that gives me a very good recovery. So clearly, I want to operate at quite low pH, but I don't want to go too far. If I have very, very low pH, that could be quite dangerous because it might start to break some of the polymer and surfactant down. It might start to, to react. Um, and obviously, handling very low pH fluids might be dangerous. So, so I have to be careful with, with what I do. And now on the other side, after I've done part A, what I want to do is to recover the polymer and surfactant. So that's the other part of the process. I want to recycle the removal agent. And what I do there is I increase the, the pH. And you can see that if I increase the pH, so these blue dots represent the recovery of the removal agent, the polymer and surfactant. You can see that above about pH 12, all coming back. So I've added acid. I've added base, I've added acid here to recover my metals, I've added some base to recover my surfactant. Obviously, acid and base together will give me salt. So that was the problem I mentioned earlier. It's going to give you a certain amount of salt. But you can see what happens here. This is the metal and the aggregate. So the proton is coming on, the metal is, is going off. So all of these metal ions will, will be replaced by um, protons. And then here, what's going to happen is the polymer surfactant will be recovered because the hydroxide ion will come in and that will break this down to give me a, a mixture of polymer and surfactant. Anyway, this is just a way of, of trying to explain to you how the process works with a kind of zero um, discharge. And that here, um, you can see how efficient the process works as I increase the number of cycles. So what I do is I, I clean a sample, I remove metal ions, I recycle the polymer and surfactant into a new uh, waste sample, and I keep going around in cycles. And this is telling me the efficiency of removal and the efficiency of usage of the polymer and surfactant over many cycles. And you can see that over six cycles, the removal efficiency is constant and the um, usage of the polymer and surfactant has only decreased to about 80%. So I can keep going round for many cycles, and that's good. So without any topping up, the cation removal efficiency did not deteriorate. So I'm just using the same material again and again and again, but I'm recovering the metal ions at the same level of efficiency, which, which is good. We noticed that after quite a few cycles, the polymer and surfactant usage efficiency started to decrease slightly. So you can see that it's not completely perfect due to there is a small leakage of surfactant into the so-called clean water. So, so the clean water I make isn't yet suitable for potable purposes, but maybe you could solve that with a membrane or, or, or some other process. But the point is that it's pretty good. There's some leakage, but with a small addition, you can keep the cycle going around many, many times. I'm going to make a comparison with some other technologies. So I have two processes um, described here, MEUF uh, and PEUF. So that stands for micellar enhanced ultrafiltration. 
So ultrafiltration is a kind of membrane process which will remove fairly large particles. Um, and the thing about the micelle, the micelles I mentioned earlier are these fairly large structures that have a charge on them. And they can be used to adsorb the metal ions directly. So what we can do is adsorb the metal ions onto the micelle surface and then filter them using ultrafiltration. And we'll get a certain uh, removal efficiency. We can also do a thing called a polymer-enhanced ultrafiltration, which is the same idea, but in this case, we adsorb the metal ion onto the polymer chain. So instead of having the polymer surfactant system, we have either the polymer or the surfactant, which gives us a non-flocculated system, which can still be filtered using uh, an ultrafiltration. And we can see what the removal efficiency is. So let's start off with MEUF. You can see the blue dots here represent the, the removal efficiency in this case of zinc, as a function of the surfactant concentration. And what you notice is that the MEUF, it requires quite a high surfactant concentration before it starts to work. And that's because we have to form the micelles. So we need to form the micelles to make that process uh, effective. And the same thing is true of the polymer. You need quite a lot of polymer chains just to absorb the material. But it starts to work really well at, at around this sort of concentration. Now, you have to compare that with the uh, removal efficiency of the PSA process. Um, so this is the SDS, or this is the surfactant concentration I'm using in the PSA process. So you compare that to that, you can see that it's um, 10 or 20 times smaller. So it's a much smaller um, concentration. Similarly, with the polymer, you're comparing something here with something here. So basically, the removal efficiency of the PSA is as high as it could be with these processes, but at a much lower concentration of the two um, agents. So that's obviously um, quite a reassuring, reassuring thing. Okay. Now, this is just very quickly to explain how it works for the anion process. So in this case, I'm removing chromate, which is CRO32 minus, I think it is. It's used quite a lot for the dyeing industry, but it's, it's pretty toxic. And it has this sort of yellow color. And again, we can do the same thing, but now we do everything in reverse. So we have an anionic polymer and a cationic surfactant, and we can remove it. Similar treatment performance, similar theory. We just reverse the charges of everything and we reverse the order of the pH adjustment. And then, again, we can recover. So this is the concentrated chromate salt, and this is the, um, the clean water that we, or the so-called clean water that we produce as part of the process. And again, um, here, yeah, this is really a diagram that's just showing you how these things that I showed you earlier the, the sweet spot. So here, I'm looking at the polymer surfactant usage efficiency. So this is the point at which the aggregates start to form. And you can see how the removal efficiency of the iron, which is the blue, in this case, it's um, a cyanide. So it's a ferrocyanide group, which is negative. It's an anion. But you can see that just at this spot here, the removal efficiency really increases dramatically. And also, the usage of this polymer surfactant increases at that point. So everything is, is working quite well. But you also notice there's an increase in the conductivity. So just at this point, you see a rapid increase um, in, in the conductivity because, again, we're forming the, the, the aggregates. Um, and really, at this point, this is where the ions, the... Uh, aggregates start to accumulate in the system. So really, it's just the same story as before. I've changed my cation for an anion, I've reversed the charges of all the materials, and I'm finding the same behavior, that just at this critical point, which is where the aggregates form, I get this rapid increase in the removal efficiency uh, of, the, of the ions. So that's really where, where I want to be. And I also have a very good usage efficiency of my polymer, so, so it's all peaking out at that point. So there's definitely an optimum point to, to run the process. 
Uh, finally, we'd like to talk a little bit about selectivity. So, so what we did here was we had a mixture of two different kinds of iron. We had a, a chromate iron, which had a double charge, and we had a ferrocyanide iron, which has, has, actually has a triple charge. And we looked at the um, selectivity as a function of pH. So what you notice is if you're running at very low pH, then you see that both of them are quite well removed. But as we increase the pH and we get up to pH 7, you see that the ferrocyanide is being removed very well, whereas the chromite, chromate isn't removed as, as well at all. At all. Um, and what's happening is really you can think that the hydroxide ions, the which we add at, at higher pH, are competing with these negatively charged ions. And it's only this triple charged ion that wins out because this has a strong enough charge to compete with the hydroxide ion, whereas this has a double charge. It's not as strong at competing. So here you can see that there's a good selectivity between a trivalent anion uh, and a divalent anion, um, which, is, which is quite good. But the question you might ask is what would happen if both of those ions had the same charge? And that's the case if you have copper and iron. And the answer is, if you have copper and iron, then you can't rely on the effect of pH to give you the selectivity. And what you have to do is to use um, chelating agents. So you have special polymers that will selectively absorb one or other um, of those ions. So selectivity in this case can be manipulated by adjusting pH to a desired value. But what we found is that to get a very, very good selection between two ions of similar charge, we have to use specially made polymers. And that's really where I'm at now in, in the research. So I don't, um, I'm not going to talk about that today. So I think the conclusion of the talk is that the polymer surfactant complexation and flocculation process is capable of um, effectively and selectively removing contaminate ions from dilute aqueous solutions. So if we have metal ions at fairly low concentration, these could be just millimolar con uh, concentration, and they may be present in mixtures, but they can be removed um, quite well from, from solution. And what we can do is to uh, recover that species into a highly concentrated product. So in other words, we turn it into a salt and that salt's quite... So we started with a di dilute stream. We ended up with a very concentrated one, and that, that's very useful. But importantly, the agent we use to remove it, which is a mixture of polymer and surfactant, can be recycled without deterioration of its removal ability in the next cycle. So in other words, we have a kind of zero discharge process where the agent of removal can be used again and again without any um, waste. So. The process has therefore the potential to turn waste into an opportunity. So we can turn, turn those waste ions into a valuable resource. And what might be the applications? Well, I think the textile industry where you have these chromate ions or these divalent or trivalent ions. We have um, fine chemical productions, um, pesticides contain organic ions, um, pharmaceuticals, and then particularly I mentioned mining industry. And then finally, <clears throat> um, semiconductors and catalysts, because they contain um, precious metals, platinum group metals, things like platinum, iridium, rhodium, rhenium, which are very, very expensive. In fact, there's a world shortage of those materials now, but they're very important, for instance, in the manufacture of um, catalysts for car exhaust. So you have the catalytic converters, and, and in fact, that's a very big business. So, so. I think scientifically it's a very interesting um, project, but it has a, a very big um, commercial potential, and I'll, I'll be watching to see how things go with the company, I'll let you know. Okay. I'll just um, acknowledge a few things. Uh, Robert, Professor Robert Thomas is retired now, but he's a, a colloid chemist working at Oxford. And then my students, so Li Cheng Shen, was a PhD student and then two um, undergraduates. I, I think you have undergraduate research projects where scholars work on, and these were very bright guys. They often do the best work. <laughs> so um, a couple of guys who were working on that. And then we actually did this as part of a collaboration. So we had a, a collaboration with um, 
the National University of Singapore and also with uh, Peking University. So we had a kind of scholarship program that funded um, Li Chang's um, scholarship. Uh, and, and this guy, Duan Tang Yen, was um, a guy from Vietnam, actually, who came over to work on the project with us. So studentship from SPOR, that stands for the Singapore Peking Oxford Research Enterprise. And finally, ISIS, and it's not the ISIS you're thinking of. ISIS actually was an Egyptian, was an Egyptian god, so they hijacked the name. But it's, it really stands for Oxford Innovation. Uh, and we, we, um, we filed a patent on this, which you can go and, go and find. They changed the name now. They call it Oxford Innovation. <laughs> I'm glad they did. <laughs> OK, I think we came to the end of that one. So uh, right, at that point. Okay, sorry if that was a bit um, complicated. It's, it's, you know, I'm talking about very specific research issues to people with a very w wide range of education. So I'm not sure if you followed everything, but if you found it interesting, um, please do have uh, a read on the papers. Now, I, um, I have another presentation to give about a, a flocculation process, but I think it might be good just to change tack for now and talk about membranes, um, and then we can come back to some more flocculation tomorrow. So uh, if you give me a minute, I'm just going to route out the um, talk. So I need to